Thanks. Perfect. Um, I don't think this is working really well with sharing my screen and the two displays, but um, I'm just going to try to make it as large as possible here. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Um, so that we can just go through it like this. I think that should. Yes, we can work. read it. Now, now it's now it's in full ah, screen. Now it's even better. Perfect. All right. Um, so let me just start really quick with introducing myself. My name is Petra Bay. I'm working uh, with Petra as well as a scientist. And I'm going to give a quick, uh, or we are going to give a quick uh, overview of the VAE today. Um, I'm going to start with just some basic introduction to the framework and into GDPR in the first place. Then Paul is going to take over with an introduction to the VAE itself. And at the end, we have a use case demonstration that I will start with. And then depending on time and uh, whether or not there are a lot of questions, um, Paul may even take over and show some more functionalities. So can I actually, there we go. Um, so yes, that's basically what I just said. We're going to first have a little bit of a framework and a background um, on, on the VIE and why it was set up in the first place. And then we're going to go into the use case demonstration. So generally, if we're talking about uh, data processing and data handling. Um, data privacy is a major concern, um, whether it be it in the processing of the data or the storage of the data. Um, this is true for basically any data um, that is out there currently. And we know that the number of data created every day increases significantly. And if we think about storing those data, um, if we then go to the next step and even share the data uh, in, a, for example, a research infrastructure as the VAE, um, we can think that the, the chance for um, this, for the privacy and the integrity of that data um, increases to compromise. So with an increased uh, threat to the privacy and the protection of that data, as a last consequence, um, we might impair the dignity of the research pa patient. Right? So we're always thinking about um, the data subject that is the provider of the data in the first place. And if we're talking about medical data, um, we can see that this is specifically the case because we're talking about very sensitive and very personal uh, data in the first place. Um, so in our case, for example, if we're looking at neuroimaging data, we can directly see um, that we have a lot of identifiable properties that make this data require specific protection, right? So identifiable properties um, are defined as something like the name, the location, even obviously the ID of a person, but also factors that are specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of a natural person. Um, so it's a broad range of properties that enable the identification of a person and that therefore property of that data subject. And if we look at the example here, we see the MRI image we see on the, on the left, um, an MRI image of my brain, of my face, and we can uh, directly see that we have a lot of identifiable properties um, just by looking at this picture that this is indeed me. So there is a direct connection um, from the data to the data subject. Um, that makes us identifiable, but also not just those, those obvious cases like my eyes and my ears, but also um, information that is inherent to the, to the modality, for example, that we're using here on the right, we see my brain with a large ischemic stroke lesion integrated. Um, that presents in itself also a lot of personal information that is specific to me. And that it's not just the, the, as I said here, the health status, so the fact that there is a lesion in the first place, but everything related even to that lesion, such as the lesion volume, the location, um, uh, affected tracts, fiber tracts, affected region, the cortical regions, all of this is information that is specific to this data subject, which is, with it, which is me. So it is um, part of, uh, I own basically the information of this, so it needs special protection. Um, if we want to process and share this data within a research environment. So what is the, what is the idea, um, how to handle this? So the European Union um, proposed or 
released the regulation, it's the so-called General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which had as a main goal to enhance an individual's right to control their own personal data. So it wanted to provide a framework, a legal framework and a legal basis um, for such things as right of access. So the data subject always has access to the data that he owns and that it owns and also the right of erasure um, usually uh, referred to as the right to be forgotten. If the data subject does not want to hit its data to be processed anymore, it has a right to be forgotten. And also the right to object. If the data subject is not um, agreeing to the processing of its data in a certain way or whatever, it has the right to object to its data to be used in that, in that, um, in that way. So the focus here from that the EU took is from the natural person itself. So it wanted to protect the dignity of the person. So in general, all processing of personal data is forbidden unless explicit consent is given. So this is the basic where we're starting from if we're looking at um, what we can do to, to have data privacy and GDPR compliant um, um, frameworks. It's always from that standpoint that generally it is forbidden unless we have explicit consent. This has already been um, applicable in the EU and the EEA, so the European Economic Area, since May 2018. And what does this imply um, to the researcher and also to, to the data processor? There are basically seven main principles within the GDPR. And start with one that all um, data processing and storage and handling of, of personal data has to be lawful, fair, and transparent. So we have to inform the data subject about the processing and the surging of the data that takes place. It has to be purpose limited. So we only use data that we, that we want for this specific case. So if we have a specific research question, we want or we limit the data to that specific purpose. We follow the principle of data minimization. It means only data that we actually need to, for example, answer a specific research question is the data that we retain. Everything else we try to get rid of. Um, the data also needs to be accurate. Right? We don't just want a broad range of personal data. We want the accurate data that is required to answer that research question. Same for storage limitation. If that data is no longer needed to, to answer our question, um, we have to erase the data. Um, same another principle is integrity and confidentiality so we have to protect the data um, from unauthorized actors to access this data and also accountability so there has to be accountability um, for the processing and the storage of that data so that there is somebody for that um, for that data subject um, that is accountable for its handling of the data and uh, the processing and if we think about our, our research case um, and the medical data that we process, how can we make sure that this is, uh, this, is, this is followed if we have the specific problem to medical data that full anonymization of this data is not possible? So we will always have identifiable properties that make it possible to link the data that is present to the data subject. And there's just two examples for two uh, publications already back even in 2015 that could show that even uh, parts of a, of a functional connectome can be used to identify the data subject that provided this data. So this is at the end what it comes down to just some correlations between a few voxels um, in your functional MRI imaging that enable the identification of that specific subject. So how do we how do we approach um, such data in the framework of, of GDPR. Um, this is all detailed and described in Article 9 of the GDPR, where we still have, again, this major, um, this major framework that generally pro the processing of such data is prohibited because we have identified a problem, unless we have explicit consent, which we always require um, even to get an ethics agreement in the first place from that data subject that we are allowed to process the data and to acquire the data, for example, in an MRI study. But also it says, Article 9 says that such processing is allowed if it is necessary for scientific research and then shall be subject to appropriate safeguards, 
technical and organizational measures that in the end ensure respect for the principle of data minimization. So the main focus here is for us now is data minimization as one of the seven principles of the GDPR that we um, want to focus on today a little bit also with the use case uh, a little bit later. So um, what does data minimization mean? What is the data minimization principle? It, um, in the end, it is the idea of processing personal uh, data in such a way that this personal data can no longer be attributed to the data subject without additional information. So without a mapping of certain, certain IDs to, to some other identifiable property of that subject, and also with additional, um, with additional required steps to make that connection in the first place. And how do we get there if we cannot anonymize it? Um, the buzzword here is pseudonymization. What this means is that we are trying to remove as much of those identifiable properties as possible um, following this data minimization principle while still be able to answer our research question. And while being aware that even as the time series of a few voxels, which we would still need for our research question, might enable the identification of that data subject. So we never reach anonymization, but we can strive for pseudonymization. And in the neuroimaging context here, what this means is, for example, the stripping of all, all unnecessary, right? We have the uh, limits, lim data limitation as one of the principles. Um, so the stripping of DICOM header information. Um, if we have it acquired in a clinical context, a lot of times you have uh, information such as names, IDs, locations, um, scanner location even, that might enable the identification of the data subject uh, in the long run. So we're trying to get rid of all of this information in the first place, but also even more um, computationally expensive processing steps such as defacing, so removing the ears, the eyes, the nose, and specific landmarks of a face that would enable um, the identification of the person, as we've seen before with my, my, my the 3D image of the MRI of my face, we could easily identify myself. So we're trying to remove this information from the image, which is also the use case that we're going to look at in a second. And if we're now talking about um, getting, still getting our data on such a research uh, infrastructure where the data will be shared between um, project members, etc., cetera, um, there's, with the GDPR, there's the requirement to um, perform something that is called the data protection impact assessment. So every time we have, a, we have a new study and we want to, for example, use the VRE to perform a processing or analysis of that data, we will have to provide a, data, a DPIA. This is a large 50 page document that um, in detail described, for example, all the processing of the data that is envisioned on the VRE or from that, uh, within that study and it details the necessity and the proportionality of the processing of the data. Again, trying to answer um, the, the questions posed by the seven principles of the GDPR to be limited, to be uh, data minimized, to be um, appropriate, um, but also to make a risk assessment saying, uh, basically listing all the possible risks that could, array, uh, could emerge for the privacy of that data and then describing mitigating measures that have been taken to mitigate those risks and reduce uh, at the end the risk of any of those events to happen in the first place. And it is again, like I said, it required before any subject, any data at all can even enter this research environment, the research infrastructure that such a risk assessment, such a GPIA is, uh, is performed. And with that, I uh, actually just hand over to, to Paul to look at a little bit at how that research environment looks in the first place. So how do I do this? I just stop sharing my screen and then you can share as a presenter, I think. I think I can share, yeah. Perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick, for this uh, great introduction to GDPR. I hope you didn't get too scared from all these documents. So um, I will continue now with the virtual research environment and uh, I will talk a little bit more about uh, fair data and research data management in general. And uh, yeah, so I'm not a scientist. Uh, 
I'm working as a software developer for the Brain Simulation Lab. And uh, yeah, I have uh, specific projects in the VIE. And uh, yeah, so I will start with some fed, uh, some data knowledge. So I think all of you here, all of you are kind of aware that we are living in an age of data. So everywhere where you look around, it's just more and more data that is produced. And this is a report from uh, Seagate Technology, which is one of the market leaders when it comes to uh, storage. Uh, so they predicted already in 2018 uh, for 2020 around like 50 zettabytes of data that is created globally, which corresponds to 50 trillion gigabyte. And actually the estimate was uh, it was in the end higher because of COVID, we were creating even more data yeah, because we're doing all these online meetings and so on. And uh, yeah, so all this data sphere is just increasing over the next years. Uh, and you really see this exponential growth in data. So it's really important uh, uh, that we find ways to deal with these massive amounts of data. And if you look into medical data, uh, Right now, it's not the biggest sector by far that's manufacturing, that's producing massive amounts of data, but this healthcare sector and uh, this medical sector has the biggest growth rate when it comes to data. And you see this everywhere. When you look to imaging like MRI, uh, you see the statement here, they went from 2,000 images to over 20,000 images for human head recording. And everywhere, just more resolution, uh, more and more data if you look to bioinformatics and if you look to all these omics sciences like genomics, proteomics, but there are many more coming over the years. Uh, so that we produce so much data uh, that uh, it is really important to get some guiding principles also for research data. And uh, there's this publication from 2016 uh, that explains fair data. Yeah, the fair data guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. And uh, FAIR, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, so we humans, we create everywhere where we deal with data. In the end, we deal with machines, with computers, right? We create data using machines. Uh, we analyze data using machines. And we store it uh, using machines. So um, the emphasis on fair data is really this machine actionability, yeah? which means um, how can we make it possible uh, that we can find data, access, interoperate, and reuse data uh, with the least human intervention so that machines can really operate on data. And uh, let's just go over these uh, principles uh, really quickly. So uh, findable. It is really about uh, not only how humans can find data, but also machines. Yeah, uh, If you have MRI images, machines might not understand what it's showing. So you need some good metadata to describe uh, your data. Another aspect is uh, globally unique and persistent data identifiers. Right. So if you have a publication, you really want a persistent identifier. This should not change in 20 years and uh, also it should be unique, right? And uh, then the next aspect, uh, how do you make your data findable? So you need to kind of publish it. And uh, if you are coming more from neuroscience, uh, you might know some of these names like uh, Open Neuro. It's an archive uh, that has a lot of bits data sets. Yeah, so neuroimaging studies. But then in other fields like electrophysiology, uh, I think uh, people use a lot this uh, Dundee archive. And then in another discipline, which, when it comes to computational models, uh, people use uh, another uh, archive, which is the new ML database. So yeah, there are many solutions out there. And uh, the next guideline for FAIR is um, accessibility. So uh, after you find the data, how do you make it, make it accessible, right? If it's a public data set, yeah, publish it on the internet. But uh, maybe you have some sensitive information that not everyone should see in that data. So you might have another version of your data 
and this data is then private and maybe also the metadata. And uh, to enable accessibility, you need then protocols uh, for authentication and authorization. So users need to say who they are and uh, users need to get permissions. M maybe some users, they can just download the data, right? But other users, they can actually modify the data, maybe add a few more subjects to the data. Okay, uh, then the next aspect is interoperability. And this is a term that you hear a lot now. And in terms of data, it means two things. So first, how can data be interoperable with other data? So how can you, for example, integrate two different data sets? This might be maybe easy if you have two data sets that follow the same standard, like for example, bits. Yeah? So you just combine them in a way. But it gets really difficult if you are having different data standards and then you need conversions between uh, data standards. So yeah, we also need to find good solutions here. And then the second uh, aspect of interoperability is how, do you, how does data interoperate with machines when it comes to storage, but also processing data, right? So, uh, I mean, I know a little, bit about, a little bit about newer imaging and when it comes, for example, to the bit standard, there are many applications that you can use right out of the box uh, with your bits data set and it works in a way, yeah? Um, so, yeah, interoperability is a very important uh, factor. And the last one, I think probably the most important one, uh, reusability. Um, so when it comes to data or you have a research question, you might first look if there's actually data out there that uh, you can reuse, right? But uh, for that, you need really good documentation of your data. So uh, the emphasis is here really on this metadata annotations that you are giving your data. And we will see also later in the VIE uh, what kind of tools we are offering uh, to uh, promote this reusability aspect. Another aspect, uh, usage licenses, right? Uh, can others use my data? Uh, how should they credit me for using my data? Or maybe I have to put some copyright licenses. Uh, yeah, this is very important too. And uh, as a last aspect, uh, I have here provenance. And uh, this is a term that you hear a lot. It is um, basically describing what is the origin of my data? How is my data changing over time? Yeah. So if you are used to um, work with code, like Python code or whatever, usually you put your code in a version control. And uh, this is another, like Git. So, and DataLed is actually a solution uh, that does this for your data set. So it's one feature of DataLed. It can keep, uh, it can track your data provenance. Who's changing your data set? Uh, who's adding things to my data set? Um, yeah, so you see everything uh, like a version control with DataLed. But DataLed has many more features and yeah, I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, it has a great documentation on the internet too. Okay, so that was a very long introduction. Um, now we get to the virtual research environment. Um, I like to compare uh, the virtual research environment uh, with cloud computing platforms. So in a way, these platforms, they uh, revolutionized how uh, software developers or people in IT operations work and also their productivity. Yeah, so they, uh, they introduced these concepts uh, for everyone like elastic computing that based on your demand, if you have a web application running and you have a lot of demand during Christmas, you just get more memory and storage, but uh, you don't buy it or you have a physical data center, you do it through the cloud computing provider and after Christmas, when your demand decreases, you just scale down your infrastructure. Yeah? So this changes a lot uh, for developers and IT ops people. Uh, but also these cloud computing platforms, they bring, uh, nowadays, they bring so many services 
that uh, makes life for developers very easy. For example, they can give you a database that is completely managed by them. So you don't need to care about backups and all these things and many more services for identity, ma identity management or security. So it really changed how people in IT work. And I like to see this, uh, uh, the VIE, in the same way, but for researchers. So how can the VIE bring all these uh, guiding principles and concepts out there to, make, to change the, life, uh, the work life for researchers? Yeah? So I talked about fair data. Yeah, how can the VIE support fair data? And uh, then another aspect, and Patrick was giving that introduction, right, on GDPR, like data protection and privacy. It's very important. Uh, then how can we uh, promote collaboration in a research project, right? And then we have uh, uh, similar things like what can we offer? same as like cloud computing platforms, like services uh, that researchers always use, but they don't need to manage them. We just provide them. And the same for computing power, like uh, when you need uh, NVIDIA graphic cards or similar things. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, the VIE is a data management platform. And uh, yeah, we want to enable medical researchers to store, find, access, and analyze their data there and uh, share their data too. And this data can also include uh, sensitive data. So we see in a bit uh, what kind of solutions we have to for sensitive data. And uh, yeah, the VIE is developed uh, in collaboration uh, uh, with a company that's Indoc Research. Uh, they have a lot of experience when it comes to research data management and uh, yeah, they have really excellent people working with us and uh, yeah, together with us from Charité IT. And uh, as a last point uh, uh, to this general aspect of the VIE, um, the VIE has officially uh, undergone a GDPR service readiness audit. And uh, so what does that mean? It means uh, the VIE can be offered as a commissioned data processor for health-related research projects, and it's in compliance with GDPR. So this, again, is a little bit hard to understand, but um, what it means for the researchers, if you have a research project, you still need to do your GDPR uh, documents, right? You need to do your data protection impact assessment usually, and you need to have all these documents approved. But once this step is done, uh, the VIE can officially process your data. Okay, so let's uh, go over the main features of the VIE. Um, this diagram uh, covers the whole architecture or all the components of the VIE. And I will try to cover all of them, but maybe I cannot go too much into detail, but then we can maybe uh, talk about this in the discussion if you have some more questions. So um, you as a researcher, as a user of the VIE, you interact with the research portal. The research portal we see later in the demo, it is a web application in the end that you access through your browser. Yeah. So from here, you enter your research project. And now there are a few things uh, or concepts that you need to understand. So uh, if you have a simple use case like a MRI imaging study, uh, you would come to us and you, uh, you create, you initiate your research project. Yeah? So you are the project administrator of this project. And now you would invite people from your lab or external collaborators uh, to join your research project. And maybe you just have people from your lab that uh, want to contribute data. So in this case, you would assign them uh, the project contributor role because these people just upload data. Yeah. They don't analyze data. Uh, yeah, they don't, they, just, they are just uploading data. Yeah. 
but then you have people in your lab that um, have specific research questions. So in this case, you would assign them a different role, the collaborator role, because these people, they can really interact with uh, almost all components of the VIE. Uh, they upload data, but they can also analyze the data. And uh, you as the manager, you are the administrator. Uh, so we will see later, it comes with a few more features. Um, but you can also assign other people this role. Um, and then if you are now uh, using the VIE actually for uh, analyzing your data, so you uploaded your data and now we are offering this workbench. And uh, these are the tools that we have currently deployed. So a very common tool that uh, researchers use is uh, Jupyter Hub. So you can create dashboards or yeah, even uh, computational models in Python and uh, share this with your research uh, colleagues. So yeah, it's a very common tool. Another tool that we offer is Apache Guacamole, which is a remote desktop gateway. So you can directly log into a Linux virtual machine or a Windows virtual machine. And you have a graphical user interface. So you can basically, you can start applications like TVB or you start application uh, free surfer. Yeah, so you are very flexible in what you want to do or, or you want some pipelines in, uh, in containers. Yeah, uh, lots of flexibility for this tool. Then we have another tool that is specifically for more structured data to create dashboards and visualizations. We see this data too. And we have a wiki tool. So if you want to already create a documentation for your project, or maybe you want some guidelines for your uh, project members. Uh, yeah. And since the VIE is uh, use case driven, um, we can always add tools. So maybe uh, you and your project members, you are used to work uh, with R Studio, right? Because you are relying on some libraries or just because you are used to it, then there's the possibility that we add this tool and make this available to you, or maybe even the whole platform. That's a really good tool. Okay, yeah, there are more tools in place, even for data discovery. Like we have a knowledge graph that uh, is really supporting this findability aspect of uh, fair data. And uh, yeah, we see this more in the demo later. Okay, so now a very important concept for the backend of the VIE uh, is to understand uh, that we have uh, two zones where your data can live. Uh, we have the green room zone and uh, the VIE core zone. And uh, the green room zone is basically a safe zone for your data. So if you upload data, um, let's assume you're uploading DICOM images that still have uh, patient identifiers in the header. Uh, this data is sensitive data. So it is a secure place. You upload this data and you store it here. Um, this data is only visible to you and your project administrator. So it is really safe in that sense. Uh, but then we can also create pipelines now. Uh, Patrick mentioned this, like for pseudonymization and make this data then available for the VIE core zone so that everyone can work on that data from your research project. And uh, to do this, you need that specific privileges uh, that in our case, it is uh, the project admin administrator that specifically needs to approve the data and say, this data is safe for processing, uh, that all my project members can run their analysis on this data. Okay, so once your data is in, v in the VIE core zone, you, are, yeah, you have a lot of uh, tools to work with your data. I mentioned Jupyter Hub, or you start applications on a, uh, on a virtual machine. But we also have uh, tools to, uh, for the data provenance. Uh, I mentioned data led earlier. Maybe you have a bits data set and you want to track uh, the provenance 
of this data set. So this is one way uh, to do it, for example. And then we have, um, uh, of course, a lot of databases. We have the knowledge graph um, where you can then uh, upload the metadata that is describing your data and make this available to the VIE so that other uh, researchers can see what is the data that you are working on. Okay, so the next component is um, hospital data sources. And uh, this is one component where I'm also involved in the development. So um, in, if, if you have a MRI imaging study, for example, and this study is ongoing, it might be not feasible to always go to the research portal and then you upload this data manually. But rather you want some kind of automatic uh, integrations so that you scan a patient at a MRI at Charité you bring this data to this uh, picture archive system at Charité, and then it is possible that we have pipelines that uh, transport this data automatically to the VIE. And we even have use cases um, where, for example, in the hospital context, this data is usually DICOM, but all the researchers, usually they work with different uh, data standards. For example, in newer imaging, BITS is very common. So we have even conversion tools that automatic that try to automatically convert this DICOM data to bits so that you can uh, easily access it from the Jupyter Hub and uh, use it for your machine learning models or whatever you're doing. And uh, yeah, there are more integrations. Uh, we have another integration for uh, more structured data that can be put in uh, SQL tables. Uh, so, for example, for survey data, we are doing this. But uh, in this hospital data sources, this component is uh, use case driven too. So you might have um, other data sources, and we could think about uh, uh, how we how we possibly create pipelines to get this data into the VIE. Okay, and as a last component. Uh, we also have a gateway to the high performance computing cluster. So if you have the need that uh, you need an NVIDIA graphic card to estimate a fancy uh, computational model, then we, we also have a gateway that you can submit your jobs there. So uh, that I think is the last feature that I have here. And uh, now I would... Um, hand over to Patrick to show us uh, your use case. Sure. I just don't know where I do it. If you stop screen sharing, then I can share again. Okay. I think I should be able to share again. Yes, main screen. You can see my screen again, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so after that introduction, we just gonna quickly go through a use case of just how some of those uh, features and functionalities that we that we mentioned before will look like for the very for the very easy use case that we're having here. So as Paul mentioned, we are accessing all of this um, just from my standard Safari browser, internet browser here, where I just log into the VIE. If I click on it. Obviously, I didn't actually save this. All right, so I can just log in and I come instantly to my overview site where I see uh, the projects that I've been assigned to. So my VIE user um, is part of the Indoc test project um, where we uh, that we use to mainly to develop, and also the Legion to TVB project, which is my personal project um, that was created um, for. Um, the use case where we have lesion, so stroke lesion data that we want to make available for brain network modeling using the virtual brain, the new informatics platform that we already know but to run brain simulations. But because there are large uh, focal stroke lesions, uh, most processing pipelines fail or provide very inaccurate uh, results. So um, there are certain steps that we uh, created in our, in our framework and our pipeline 
that we can run to make a fully processed high-end um, processing pipeline for, for such data, including, for example, the human connect home, the minimal processing pipeline, etc. So in our use case right now that I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to show the, the smallest computationally uh, least expensive step, which is actually the pseudonymization step that I mentioned before, um, where we just want to deface a single T1 image of myself. Again, because we are seeing we're already here live in the VRE, but um, because our BPIA is not finished, we are not uploading actual data, but we're uploading only data where the data subject is also me. So I actually own the data and I'm avail uh, I'm, it's possible for me to use actual neuroimaging data on the VRE because it's uh, all of those brains and all of those images that you see is actually, um, it's actually my own MRI images. So we landed on our overview page, as uh, Paul already mentioned, you see uh, the last updates that have uh, that took place. And we can see data. Um, I mean, I already did a lot of the, the steps previously, but what we're interested in right now is the data that I uploaded here. It's called the bits lesion data. That is, consists of two parts. One is the subject part that is following the bits standard. So we see um, for each subject, we have our session, our data set description, and then we have anatomical data being our subject T1, uh, T1 image, corresponding JSON T2 image, the corresponding JSON, as well as uh, the stroke specific lesion mask that we require for some steps down the line. So that's the, the data that we uploaded using the VAE portal. That's one, the neuro imaging, the bit standard neuro imaging data, and also following the Open Minds standard for metadata, we also uploaded this. We can take a quick look in this as well, um, just to have an idea of the information that is present in this metadata schema. So these are all the, the, the number of files that are present to describe uh, the metadata of my current data set that I uploaded. Right? So we have the data set, we have the current version of it, like Paul mentioned, we can have provenance tracking, um, creating over time different version of this of the same data set, for example, after specific processing steps, after uh, new data was added, we can create new versions and keep all of this in the metadata schema that we can look at in a second as well, um, using our knowledge graph. So what do we want to do with the data? We want to deface it. So we're going to make use of the workbench tools that are available in the VRE. And I think it's important to mention that we are going through this in the use case right now, and I'm doing most of the stuff manually just to show it. Um, but VRE provides the functionality to have a fully automated pipeline. All of this can be done with scripts. Um, like Paul mentioned, we have automated, um, even regular, for example, daily um, integration of data that can instantly uh, trigger other processing jobs. So all of this can be can be automated. But right now, we're looking at the, the manual version of it. So how do we how do we start the processing of this? We're making use of the workbench tools. As Paul mentioned, we provide um, Apache Guacamole. And for my specific use case here, my project, I have two virtual machines set up, one being a green room virtual machine and the other one being the core zone virtual machine that we'll use in a second. But right now, we upload it, as I said, we uploaded the data to the VRE portal. That means that the first impact, uh, the first contact that the data has with the VRE is in that specifically user restricted access restricted green room. Um, this is, as Paul mentioned, restricted to me as the user. Um, so I am the only person that can access this green room in addition to the project administrator, which also happens to be me in this case. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the virtual machine and just uh, a command line interface version of it. We're logging in. Um, all of those logins from the Charité VAE, but also in the uh, virtual machines, etc., are handled um, via the Charité Active Directory. Uh, so everybody with a Charité ID, AD account um, can instantly uh, require or um, yeah, um, ask for access to the VAE, and all of this will be handled um, internally using the Charité AD account. So as you can see, we're now in an Ubuntu machine. Um, where we want to process our data. We already made this data available inside this machine um, because what we saw on the portal is just the visual representation of the backend storage where the data is actually stored in the database. Um, 
and we can make it available in each of the different workbench tools, be it um, the green room VM that we are right now, be it Jupyter Hub, or, um, wherever. We can make this available using a tool that we developed or actually in our developed, um, which is called the VRE command line interface tool, VRE CLI, that handles data management between the dis different instances within the VRE. Um, is one of the um, important aspects, for example, that um, Paul showed in the overview that we have between the green room and the core zones. Um, it's also important to know that there is no direct um, communication between those two. There's no direct access between those two zones because we're always having data protection um, as the main as the main driver here. So to make sure that there is only um, authorized and specific access. Uh, movement from of data from the green room to the to the core zone. There is no direct connection, but the VRE CLI tool actually enables the movement between the different um, instances of data. As you can see, we can move data sets, we can use, um, move and synchronize certain files, um, etc. So what we already did here, we already downloaded the data that we want to process um, from the backend storage to our to our uh, VM that we are right now. We see we have our data available. We also have container available. Containers are a way to um, make software independent of the, of the host system and to, to enable really um, reproducibility and also a good version color control data. So it's pretty much a standard in um, creating even neuro imaging software these days to have containerized versions of the different aspects. And we see in our container here, we have the VRE DFACE container, which is a singularity container that I created that performs the process of defacing. And this is the one that we're gonna wanna try to use in our live demo here, um, and which should work if everything goes fine. Um, the other part that we downloaded is uh, made available here is the bits lesion data. As we just saw in the portal again, our open minds, but also, also su our subject data that we want to process. Um, I actually have to make this available. Make it easier to post some data there. Um, so what we want to do is we just go into our container. Um, that actually doesn't matter. Um, we're trying to copy paste our singularity call, just a standard um, way of calling our singularity container, right? Just singularity run the container that we provide the VAED phase. And we're giving some input data, which is the subject 0001 one image that where we want to perform defacing. And we start and we see that the container is already starting to run our defacing pipeline. In the meantime, we can actually look at what the metadata that we uh, that we also uploaded right in our open minds um, subject folder that we looked at in the portal, how that can look in the in the VRE knowledge graph. So to this to this end, we also go to slash kg for knowledge graph, and we can access the same data after we again use the VRE CLI to make it available to push our open minds metadata into the into the Blue Brain Nexus, that is the basic software that provides the knowledge graph functionality. We see my project leading to TBB, and I actually already have this set here. For example, one of those. Um, um, metadata schemas that we saw was the data set version. So if we click on it, again, we can see the actual content of the file. So this is um, how OpenMinds, the OpenMinds uh, metadata standard is structured. Those are JSON LD files, so linked JSON files that contain the information um, for a specific property, for example, the data set version, but also linked to corresponding um, to corresponding properties and resources that have already been created, be it, for example, the author that just now contains the ID to the object that contains the information about the author, et cetera, full documentation, a digital identifier, um, all of this stuff. We can also use it and have a visual representation of it. I actually like this one better, where we can see the different properties that have been made available in our open mind schema that for example we have some information about the modality the author the corresponding license um, but also the digital identifier we can expand it we can look at links to further um, further data that is, information that is available from the funding the fund uh, for example the actual corresponding funder and all of this right now is as we saw based on the lesion to tvb project 
uh, let's scroll up a little bit. Um, so by, right now, what we're looking at is just the metadata within my project. Like we said, if we want, for example, provenance tracking, this is the, based on the data set version and the links of the data set version. If we have further processing steps, we can create new open minds data, metadata for that version, and then have it linked automatically in this, in this fashion. But we can also use it to have a, a, a searchable and queryable knowledge graph across data sets that have been made available in the VRE. That, um, in that way, researchers are uh, able to look for examples for corresponding modalities or even um, if you add more um, metadata information, such as disease states, population groups, et cetera, that are relevant for their research case and can search and query those, those meta information, just like I did within just the data set version from my very small uh, test set that I have here. And when we look at this, we can look, ah, it's actually already finished. Um, um, so we can want to look at the results. In this case, because I run the defacing pipeline, my uh, image, um, we're following the, the principle of data minimization. I don't need the, all that identifiable properties to run my further, my further processing of the lesion cases. Um, so I want to run defacing, but I also want to make sure because lesion are very complicated and have a lot of artifacts that impair the performance of a lot of processing, um, processing software. Um, I also have a, GUI version for my green room because I want to visually inspect the results. And then to do this, we're actually just going to leave the command line interface version of this and look at the access the same VM, but now using a, a desktop, a, a GUI version of it. Just going to log in again. And then we see we're basically just on a standard Ubuntu machine, virtual machine. As Paul mentioned, this is available as a Linux machine, but also as a Windows machine for some software where that is required. And we can see at the, we have again this data available that we saw before, our container, but our data as well. And if we look at the data that we just processed, the bits lesion data, session one, anatomical, we now see the first uh, new folder that we just created, the defacing plot. So we can look at the plot that we, that we created, but we can also use additional software as, as mentioned before, if we require it. And for this case, for example, we want to use a Nifty viewer um, so we also installed MRI Crow GL on that virtual machine in a way that we can now actually look at the 3D image of this and just to make sure and validate our processing um, worked in a way that we wanted for this, for this, um, for our use case right now. Um, oh, wait, my connection is really slow right now, I'm sorry. Um, so we see we are happy with how the, how the data turned out. So we can push our data from this virtual machine instance back into, um, into the portal green room that we saw before. So we have it available here. And then I already pushed it into a new folder called bits lesion data deface previously. And as Paul mentioned, um, only the project administrator is now able to push this data to the cause. So I, me as a project administrator, I'm happy with the results that I just, uh, I just looked at it and I can manually select the data and copy it to the core. You see, you already get a warning um, that it, is, it has been copied to the core before, and then you get another, um, another uh, pop up to ask you to confirm it. Again, in mind, the, um, the idea that this is a, a, a specific process to make sure that you actually, the data that you now push into the core zone and make it available to all other project members is a um, active decision by the project admin because he's, uh, they are um, sure that this is the data that they want to push to the core. So what we can do in the next step, we can actually just um, again use workbench tools in the core zone, um, just like we did before. We have the green room uh, virtual machines. We now use uh, a core zone version of this. I log in. And we have the same functionality available for our core zone. Ideally, if that loads at some point, there we go. It's just the connection at the laboratory, so I'm sorry. And then we can see that um, we have the same uh, tool again available, the VRE CLI, if we want to pro again, push data into the storage and pull data that we just pushed 
into the storage, the defacing version, if we want to make it available now in the course of where all project member and this is again depending on the role as Paul mentioned before if you're uh, also a project collaborator you're not just a contributor you can now use those workbench tools to actually work on the on the data that is available in the course so what we want to do here is we don't want to run another another container um, that would just be repetitive of what we just saw in the, in the the green room this is the same functionality but something that is also available in the core zone um, as we've seen also in the overview with paul before is the high performance computing environment from the shutter team so we can easily access this from inside our uh, virtual machine of uh, of the vre and something that is important to know is that this the charity hpc lives in the same firewall um, as the VAE, we are still inside of that protected space of the Charité firewall. So even though we, we might push our data now to the HPC environment, we're still living in that protected space. So we don't have to worry about um, using high performance environments and clusters um, that do not provide the, the GDPR compliant uh, privacy protection that the VAE has. We're still living in that same secure space. And to just jump to the to the HPC environment, we can just easily tunnel to, to the corresponding cluster that we want to use. In our case, it's just the, the test server. And we can see we're already, um, already connected to the, to the cluster, to the HPC cluster. Um, also this, again, as Paul mentioned, uh, we are use case driven. This is still an ongoing development um, that in the future, it will be available to just commit jobs to the HPC from within this, um, um, from within the VM. So even this tunneling won't be necessary anymore um, going forward. But what we want to do here is just, a, we are in a HPC environment. So we just um, prepare some batch script that we want to run um, um, for our use case. It's for example, um, if we want to further process our data using computationally expensive processing steps, we can see we just provide um, some standard Slurm batch scripts defining the resources that we want, um, some documentation, of course, for good pro um, coding practices, some input information. And then we just see we provide, um, again, a singularity container. So we're just saying singularity run. And then the HCP pipeline processing container, which takes several hours um, to run, so we want to use, uh, we want to harness the power of the HPC environment here for our data, and we can just commit this this a batch script to run our um, our processing using that. And I think um, we don't actually need to run this right now because um, that will actually take around ten hours. Um, but I think we're pretty much done with the functionalities that I wanted to show for this use case. So we've seen how we uploaded data into the portal. We've seen how um, to use the workbench tools to make uh, processing of that data. We've seen how to follow GDPR compliant um, processes by um, performing some pseudonymization, defacing the data, and then how to make it available for every other, for all the other project members, and then run further processing, even using the HPC environment to run computationally expensive steps. Um, and again, we said all of this could be done automatically, but just to showcase the functionality we are doing this uh, in the manual way. And I think we could now either go to um, some more use case, um, some more functionalities from Paul, or if you already have questions, we could um, we could jump to this. Uh, I'm pretty open. Um, but I think um, we can actually go, go back to I you. Would just, I would just suggest, um, can you go to the vie.charite.de uh, to the home page, not logging into the VIE. Sure. Uh, so what I just wanted to mention is, um, can you click on getting started on the top? So everyone uh, that has the affiliation with Charité, it is very easy to get access to the VIE. Uh, you just do go through this little survey, uh, fill in your email address, I guess, and Charité username. And uh, you basically get access to our test project. And from that test project, you can start Jupyter Hub. You can open all these tools that we mentioned. Um, yeah, so I really encourage you to uh, 
uh, try this. And if you don't have a Charité affiliation, uh, yeah, you go through that survey too. And in the end, uh, you will contact us, I guess. Right, if you click not sure, I think in the end, uh, yeah, that's a contact form. And uh, we will see how we can create an account for you. Uh, uh, it's probably possible, I would say. Exactly. So all, all we require, it, it would be required because, like I said before, the logging in is all handled via the Charity Active Directory. So even if, you do, if you're not a Charity employee, um, but there is some research collaboration and uh, some contractual um, collaboration with the Charity. It is possible even for an external scientist to create such a Charity ID account um, with, a, with an email, etc. you provide um, so that you can also access uh, the VIE um, to enable multi-center studies, etc. Right. Okay, then, I mean, I could show the, to make that to, uh, demo complete, I could just uh, show uh, how Jupyter Hub looks. But I think most of you people here know this, just to make it complete maybe. Uh, so if you log into the VIE, And then this is the project you would be added to. So there are a lot of users. Um, and then you have the workbench tools. So uh, Jupyter Hub, uh, I think most people know here, it's a very good tool uh, to do your Python dashboards or processing pipelines. So it's almost as using it on your local computer. You, you can install dependencies, yeah. And uh, then you, you can do your magic with your scripts. Uh, just, just, I would just show more if you have specific questions regarding this, but I think all of you know this. Uh, and then, uh, another tool that we have for documentation that is XWiki. So here you can create a wiki. It's kind of complex even how you can create a wiki. Uh, you can also see our user guide uh, is using the same uh, software. Uh, so if you come to the VIE, uh, you can go through this user guide tool to see like how you can analyze data or how you uh, uh, use the HPC and so on. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, that's it uh, for the short demo. I think now we could uh, answer some questions or maybe you even have already uh, a specific research project uh, and think about using the VIE. I don't, I don't know too much about the audience actually.